Thank you, Emma. That was, um, uh, that was a lovely introduction. I sometimes worry about that introduction um, in that it sounds a little bit like I can't hold down a job. <laughs> um, I, too, wish to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders both past and present. We are so grateful to all of you for your attendance this evening. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to um, speak uh, both to you and with you about our work. Uh, from our point of view, having the opportunity to engage with people from the communities that uh, you represent or participate in or hail from is such an important opportunity. We've had, as you heard from Emma, um, already some, some formalised discussions in similar forums, uh, one in Brisbane and there's another one planned for Canberra next month. But we too have also had a number of less formal engagements uh, with various members of the culturally and linguistically diverse and multicultural communities represented right across our nation, both in those informal settings with uh, representatives of the Royal Commission staff, as well as the opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one with people in our private sessions as well. Uh, the next 12 months for the Royal Commission leading up to the finalisation of our work and the delivery of our final reports is a crucial time for us. So your uh, attendance tonight and interaction with us comes at a very crucial time in terms of the formation uh, and development of our underlying policy positions and ultimately our final recommendations that we will be uh, handing to the Australian Government. Tragically, the very nature of the sexual abuse of a child, any child, creates inhibitors and silencers that are barriers to us being able to intervene protectively and appropriately with that child. When we add to that the barriers of language and culture and ethnicity and uh, in some cases religious affiliations and what <clears throat> has been, what has happened inside the institutionalisation of those religious affiliations, those barriers get greater higher, deeper, wider, and harder to get over. So we are looking to you tonight to assist us and to engage with us, to give us your ideas and thoughts and comments, or indeed give us guidance even by your questions to how we can address some of those barriers. Before we turn to that though, um, as um, Emma indicated, I will say some introductory things and I'll just put my watch here to keep myself contained. I will say some introductory things about the work of the Royal Commission, in particular for those of you less familiar with what we've been doing, but perhaps as a refresher for those who've had some intermittent contact with us but haven't, uh, haven't had any contact with us recently. And I thought I'd do that by framing up um, three questions and then um, hopefully addressing them satisfactorily for you. And if not, I'm sure you'll ask me questions about that when we get to it. 
So firstly, what is our inquiry all about? Secondly, how are we going about our work? And third, what are we working towards? And once we go through those three areas, we'll then open up for discussion and questions. Um, Emma has talked to you already about safety tonight, safety for you, and we are very mindful about that. So I'm glad that that has been spoken about, and please feel free to um, communicate any concerns that you have both
sexual abuse of children has included um, physical, emotional and, psych and severe psychological abuse as well. And I'm sure that you can readily accept that, uh, unfortunately, those forms of abuse regularly go together. We, uh, I'll, come, I'll come to the terms of reference in a minute, but just leave that there for me. Um, again, what is not included in our terms of reference is familial abuse, intrafamilial abuse that does not connect to an institutional context. Um, sadly, all too often, uh, intrafamilial abuse will be the precursor to a child being removed from home and placed in out of home care and in that way we are regularly hearing uh, of a number of accounts of intrafamilial abuse being the um, part of the history of a survivor's account to us where the abuse goes on to recur in an out-of-home care setting. We are also hearing uh, accounts of intrafamilial abuse in, uh, in the context of institutions that have permeated families and become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So let me um, give you an example um, just from uh, last week to accounts that were brought to us in private sessions. Both of these um, people were reporting the uh, sexual abuse of themselves as children in the context of their families being members of the Jehovah's Witness community in circumstances where um, in the context of them reporting their abuse to adults within the community, each of them was told as children that they must not um, report to police and must not report to counsellors because these were considered to be um, worldly institutions that um, would not be able to deal appropriately uh, with them and so, thus the accounts were kept inside um, the uh, inside the Jehovah's Witness community and um, I use the term um, dealt with uh, in in the context of the accounts that we were given but uh, that um, unfortunately resulted in uh, n not uh, not ending the abuse and compounding much of the uh, long, long lasting impact on these two people who came and spoke with us last week. Some of you may have seen last year we actually did a public hearing into the Jehovah's Witness community and I, I think that report is um, still underway, it hasn't yet been published. We do not have time limits on um, the time that uh, people can, uh, the time at which the sexual abuse that's being reported can be reported to us. So in other words, we have people coming into us in their 70s and 80s who are reporting the sexual abuse of themselves as children and on some occasions they are actually telling us that we are the first report that they've made. So that's what I mean by we don't have time limits. There's, um, as long as the person is able to come in and give an account or indeed write to us and give an account, we will accept that. Let me turn now to our terms of reference which helps explain um, what our inquiry is about. Our terms of reference um, I'll, I'll try and make it as um, make the language as um, as accessible as I can because it's quite complex and wordy. We are required by our terms of reference, and I, I think the expression is is a profound one. So I, I quite like to use those words 
to bear witness to those who um, have directly survived the sexual abuse of themselves as children or indeed indirectly uh, have uh, have been victims of the sexual abuse of a child and sometimes we will have siblings of those who've been sexually abused as children, we'll have parents, um, sometimes we'll have those who've witnessed the sexual abuse of others in an institutional context who wish to come and speak with us. Our terms of reference also uh, require us to look at what institutions should do better to improve best, uh, to, to aim at best practice, best practice in the prevention, and obviously that is the number one aim, the prevention of the sexual abuse of children in the institutional institutions or institutional context, to examine and ultimately, of course, make recommendations with respect to the best practice in improving the reporting of the sexual abuse of children, responding to those reports that are being made, and in looking at that area of our work, we are talking about, from our point of view, how we're framing that up is improving the reporting of the sexual abuse of children by children and young people themselves, by the staff and volunteers inside institutions, by the parents and carers and guardians of children, and indeed by the community, the general community around that child, which has particular significance for us this evening. Our terms of reference also require us to examine and make recommendations with respect to the reduction of those impediments or barriers that I spoke about a moment ago to reporting, investigating and responding to the sexual abuse of children. And uh, finally, to look at uh, what should be done to alleviate the impact of past sexual abuse, first of all to understand it, I should say, and then to alleviate and address the impact of the sexual abuse of children, and that includes um, areas like civil redress and, and uh, compensation that we have already reported upon and made um, a number of recommendations with respect to. And in our view, also requires us uh, to look at the whole criminal justice system as it impacts upon this area of reporting, investigation of, and responding to the sexual abuse of children. So we might come back to our terms of reference in our discussion, but that's just a general overview. So how are we doing that? How are we, how are we setting about to frame up the work that we do? Well, we are endeavouring to do it as comprehensively as possible and um, in as many ways as we can in terms of ensuring the, the best chances of us hearing um, what people want to say to us as well as um, working at, uh, at a research and policy level. So let me just give you a little bit of a sense of the way in which we're doing that. Um, Emma spoke to you about our private sessions. When we started uh, our work on the Royal Commission, given the nature of what uh, we are asking people to talk to us about, it became absolutely apparent, if it wasn't already apparent, at least to some of us, that offering a private, confidential, informal and supportive space to people who would be prepared to come and speak with us was essential. Uh, and we sought from the government 
uh, in uh, consideration of that an amendment to the Royal Commissions Act so that we could um, institutionalise the private session program that we wanted to conduct. So we did get an amendment to the Royal Commissions Act to allow us to meet with people one-on-one -on -one in those informal settings and uh, to be able to communicate with people and listen to them in a private and assured confidential space. As Emma said to you, um, last week we saw a person, uh, we, we conducted private session number 5000 and we continue to, to conduct private sessions and indeed we're holding private sessions, I know in um, one of my colleagues is here in Melbourne this week doing private sessions here. We um, support people to attend in every way that we, we, we can. So we certainly um, offer interpreters for um, anyone who wants them. We will give people financial assistance um, to attend if they need to um, travel. We will um, do our best to provide um, uh, both counselling and moral support for those who are coming in by themselves. But we also um, encourage people to bring in their own support people uh, and they will regularly do that. In the course of those 5,000 private sessions, we have certainly heard from a diverse range of people from um, culturally diverse and ethnically and linguistically diverse, including di di diverse religious backgrounds in our private sessions. Um, we have been told by a range of people that it has been for them um, a valuable thing to do, to have a safe and confidential space wherein they can talk to us about what happened to them. And of course, from our, from our, our point of view, the richness and importance and value of what people bring to us in those rooms is crucial to us being able to hear directly from those so directly affected and impacted by their experience to be able to learn, um, help shape and guide and direct the work of the Royal Commission. So it's um, such a valuable um, such a valuable opportunity to hear from, from people. I should say we don't, um, the, the way in which the sessions are conducted is that there isn't a formality about the way in which we engage with people. People often come in worried that they're going to be um, asked questions in a, in a court-like or even a police-like interviewing structure and uh, that doesn't happen. We um, discuss with people how they would like to conduct the private session and um, just try and get in tune with them and work with them in that way. So that's our private sessions. Again, we might have some more discussion about that afterwards. The public hearings are much more the public face of the Royal Commission and um, for those of you who have um, been following some of our work, you're much more likely to have seen um, snippets of the work of the Royal Commission through those public hearings. They, of course, look much more formal and much more like a traditional, the way it, they work much more like the way in which a traditional courtroom works. So people come in and give evidence and we, uh, we don't compel, of course, any survivors in. All the survivors who come and speak um, publicly at our public hearings have done so um, voluntarily, so they've indicated that that's what they're prepared to do and we have um, uh, taken, taken them up on their offer to speak um, publicly in that way. You will sometimes see, again, if you've watched our public hearings, that sometimes you can't see the face of the person, you can only hear their voice, sometimes you can see their face but um, they, a, a, a pseudonym will be used, usually a collection of letters that has nothing to do with their name. Um, sometimes they won't be in the hearing room at all. 
uh, they'll be in another location and only have their voices beamed into the hearing room that we're in. And sometimes the, the barrister called counsel assisting the commission will read out the statement and the person whose statement it is um, will, will might, might be sitting in the body of the hearing room or might be watching the live webcast at a remote location. We, that, that's because we will, of course, respect um, any request from the, um, any survivor as to how he or she wishes to give evidence, so we will accommodate those wishes as best we possibly can. Um, we used the opportunity in those public hearings to examine in more detail uh, what has happened inside the institution. And we, we do our best to select case studies, of course, that are going to provide representative examples of systemic issues inside those institutions to help us address all of our terms of reference, as well as um, giving us the opportunity to bear witness to those uh, courageous enough to come forward in that public environment. We get quite a bit of feedback from um, the community generally, from various aspects of the community, in particular those who are watching the live webcasts of our public hearings and um, it's often circulating in the communities where um, that, that, that those public hearings are emanating from, who tell us that there is um, at least some community awareness raising going on as a result of our public hearings program, and that, of course, is very reassuring to hear. We are also getting some feedback that there is some institutional awareness raising that's happening too, including some institutions actually making changes to the way in which they do things consistent with um, what is being um, demonstrably shown in our public hearings as um, massive mistakes inside institutions. So we've had, we're at, I think, um, the sporting public hearing that's going on up in Sydney um, last week and this week is case study 39. Uh, so that tells you that we've done 39 public hearings to date. We're in that number now. Um, r relevantly to um, some of the issues of relevance to our gathering here tonight, I thought I would just make mention of um, one of the public hearings that uh, certainly had um, some of the features that I, I touched upon before about um, the various barriers and restraints inside communities. And that was our case study number 22. Uh, some of you may have followed that. That was a case study into um, one, uh, two Orthodox Jewish institutions, one in Melbourne, uh, in, um, uh, in Caulfield in Melbourne, and one in Sydney in Bondi. Uh, we examined in the course of that uh, public hearing over the space of two weeks, uh, we, we had, uh, I suppose, um, a close look at the governance structure of those two institutions, the policies in place, or in some, some situations, lack of policies in place, and practices and procedures in place with respect to an ability or inability to respond to child sexual abuse. In the course of that, um, you, you, for those of you who saw anything of it, you would appreciate that we heard from a range of survivors of their experiences and indeed from some family members of survivors of their experiences. And just to touch upon a few of the issues that came up in the course of that public hearing, we certainly had evidence from witnesses as to um, their uh, feelings of um, or experience of isolation, 
their um, evidence as to their experience of inside their communities, um, a sense of being uh, vilified, uh, as I've said, ostracised and isolated. And indeed, we heard some evidence about um, the actual shunning of individuals in, in that religious sense. We heard evidence from some witnesses about losses of friendships, losses of employment opportunities, losses of marriage opportunities, and of course embedded and underwritten in all of that, huge amounts of um, pain and suffering, anger and sadness and grief were certainly heard by us in the course of that public hearing. We had some evidence about um, acknowledgement from some of the members uh, in positions of authority. Some of the members um, gave evidence about an acknowledgement of the gaps in the governance structure, uh, gaps in the knowledge of the impact of the sexual abuse upon children, and indeed some evidence about how the community within our community um, struggled within itself. And we also heard some evidence about the way in which some of those issues are currently being addressed. I should, uh, of course, say that that report uh, is um, currently being completed but hasn't yet been, been published. We are not just looking at historical abuse. Uh, there is, uh, I know, some sense out there, and I, I, I hear it referred to from time to time by some of the media outlets about the Royal Commission looking into historical cases of child sexual abuse. We're not. We are um, uh, sadly uh, also looking into very contemporary examples of institutional sexual abuse of children. And uh, indeed, just in the last few weeks, um, some of you may have, again, uh, seen the public hearing we did into uh, what we called the performing arts community. And we had two particular institutions that we looked at. One was the Australian Institute of Music, and the other was a dance company called RG Dance Company. And uh, we did that in Sydney. Um, that is uh, so contemporary that the um, perpetrator um, is currently awaiting sentence. So uh, that is currently absolutely before the courts. I just wanted to touch upon that case just to say that we did have uh, a number of members from quite diverse um, multicultural communities who participated in that hearing, uh, parents of children from that school who had been directly affected, um, some in the most tragic ways and some less directly. Uh, so from our point of view, that was um, important to uh, see those members coming through, community members coming through. We, um, the third significant way in which we are also doing our work is in our whole research and policy area. So we've undertaken a whole range of research and policy development. Um, people have sometimes said to us, what about all the inquiries that have gone before? So inquiries in Victoria or in New South Wales or in Queensland. We haven't had a national inquiry before into the sexual abuse of children, but we have had a number of other inquiries that have touched upon parts of this area. Um, I can reassure you that our policy people have got them all. They have done a range of pieces of work uh, at, in terms of distilling the essence of what's gone before, and indeed one of the pieces of work they've done is um, gone through each of those inquiries, had a look at the recommendations that have come out of each of those inquiries, and have followed up with the receivers of those recommendations, um, mostly governments, to ask 
of those governments, what have you done? This is the Royal Commission asking you, what have you done with respect in response to those recommendations? And indeed our intention is to report uh, on that as well. We, uh, and, and of course, to ensure that we don't reinvent the wheel, that we build on what's already known and that we, we work with um, those inquiries that have, already, uh, that have already gone before us. There are a large number of research projects that um, <coughs> are being undertaken and some have been published already. I think, um, I think the figure's 20, 21 published so far. Um, and uh, m many more on the way. And of course, we are conducting, as I said before, our private, um, private engagement with various stakeholders, our private roundtables, and some of you have been to those already, as well as public roundtables, in particular on specific topics and issues. So we've had roundtables into um, the whole certain public forums, both private and public forums, with respect to the whole out-of-home care sector. And let me just pause for a moment to say we currently have a consultation paper out now on the out-of-home care sector and um, I importantly, I'm sure, for a number of you in this room and perhaps the organisations that you work inside, there's a, a very... Um, particular vulnerability that we see regularly with respect to children in, in out-of-home care. So um, please take the time to have a look at that consultation paper and we would welcome your input in whichever way you wish to give it, either face-to-face um, -face or in writing, in discussions over the telephone with um, our staff. I know they would be very keen to hear from you. We've had con consultations with respect to what makes an institution child safe and we of course will um, give considerable focus to that in our final report including recommendations about that again it has a very particular meaning in this um, in this uh, cohort that we're gathered in this evening <laughs> We have done uh, already published a report in the area of um, working with children checks and we've made 39 recommendations in that area and perhaps of um, significance again to this group is recommendations with respect to um, uh, religious uh, personnel and officials of um, religious settings. So please have a look at that and we might come back to talk about that. We've had public for um, private roundtables and lots of engagement with schools generally, complaint handling and, as I said to you, criminal justice, civil redress, um, civil disability, uh, um, sorry, disability and civil redress. We, so we have an enormous range of policy work going on at the moment in a whole range of areas. but. Um, we, we know we've still got considerable work to do and considerable information to gather, hence our enthusiasm for being with you tonight. Just wanted to say um, just a couple of things finally about, um, about disclosures. Um, we, are, we, we are gathering lots of information about what creates barriers uh, f what what are barriers? I more correctly, I should say, for <coughs> children and young people right now, right here in our country, to disclosing the sexual abuse of themselves in um, in an institution or an institutional context. Um, some may say even at all in any context. <clears throat> so we've heard from hundreds of survivors about the challenges of reporting the sexual abuse of themselves in an institutional context and what we've been able to glean and put together as the barriers, the reasons, the self-talk that goes on for, to, to 
um, silence those people as children and young people. The list sounds something like this. I couldn't speak, I couldn't say anything because of fear of, and I'm talking now about all children and young people uh, as reported to us via our, in particular, our private sessions. I couldn't speak because of fear. Fear of retribution, fear of retribution from the perpetrator, fear of retribution from the perpetrator who threatened me or threatened my family, fear of not being believed, a huge silencer for children, fear of getting into trouble, as it's often expressed by um, people, even as adults. Um, we'll talk about that, that, that deeply entrenched concern that kept them um, quiet as children and young people. Shame, stigma, guilt, embarrassment. People will often talk to us about not having the words. So these are people um, who, who have English. Um, giving children and young people a structure in which they can feel safe to disclose and understand um, that it is something that can be spoken of. So what we're hearing back from the communities is that there still exist very strong cultural taboos about discussing sex and anything around it, very uh, strong um, shame and stigma attached to uh, disclosures and identifying oneself as, um, as uh, someone who needs to talk about what's happening to them. We're also getting information back from communities that there still exists um, as there does, we know, in, in the wider community, um, disbelief that, that this has occurred and disbelief that it might be occurring now. We're also hearing, uh, as we do from a range of communities that we intersect with, discouragement from community members about reporting the abuse because it will bring shame on a community um, that is already struggling with its isolation and with its negative treatment and with, uh, and with that comes that fear of exacerbating the stereotyping, uh, the negative stereotyping that is already um, being experienced by some members of those community communities and that um, language about the fear of being ostracised and of community retribution and, and of losing support from networks, community-based networks and family uh, repeats itself to us too. Um, as well as, importantly again for um, us this evening, we're also hearing about the um, fear that keeps some families silent from reporting about the institutional abuse 
or abuse inside institutions of children, fear of negative consequences for obtaining um, permanent residence or indeed um, formalising uh, um, temporary visa status. So whilst it's comforting for us to see some evidence of, as I've said to you earlier, about an increase in the awareness of, ch of the sexual abuse of children and its shattering and devastating and lifelong impact on a young developing person, uh, we know we still have a long way to go. So what we're working towards finally is a set of recommendations that cover off on our terms of reference that will address um, legislative changes. And we, we have already made some recommendations about legislative changes and we anticipate making um, a considerable number more. Structural changes, administrative changes, recommendations for social changes, changes to um, e education systems, uh, really we are only, I suppose, limited by um, our imagination and the power of the information that's coming to us. But, folks, to do this, we need you, which is uh, where I started tonight and where I'm going to finish now, because we need you to help contribute to the development of those recommendations. We need your opinions, your views, your experience, your ideas, um, however you want to express those to us, um, to ensure from our point of view that when we do those, uh, hand down those final recommendations in December of next year, that we provide to the Australian government recommendations that reflect uh, the range of changes that need to be made to ensure the safety and protection of all children in our country, in Australia. And it's um, your knowledge, your experience and your understanding that is so vital to us in being able to um, perform that task. So as I said, for those of you who don't, um, who don't feel that you have quite formulated your ideas or that this is not the forum in which you feel that you can pass on your ideas or say what you want to say, there will be opportunities to um, make yourselves known to the Royal Commission staff. You can write to us confidentially. I'm sure um, Sally and her team will make themselves known to you as well in terms of um, being able to connect faces and get phone numbers and perhaps uh, ask for the opportunity to meet at a time other than this evening and we would welcome that. Otherwise, I'm going to stop now and um, hopefully start hearing from you uh, whatever it is that you want to say. Um, it doesn't have to be a question, it can simply be a comment which might stimulate someone else to um, participate in our discussion.